of the issues with a lot of pain patients is they get into having to do random drug screen, urine tests. Um, and of course, or let's just even, not even a pain patient, anybody, pre-employment drug tests now. Uh, drug screens are used for a lot of people to see if, if they're drug free to come and work for, for us or you might have random testing on a job, whatever. Uh, and of course, there was an old um, quote years ago that urine testing leads to harder drugs. And it kind of comes out because probably the most mild illicit drug that, that people use for recreation, recreationally is cannabis, marijuana. Um, and yet it's a fat soluble substance. So it stays in the system for a long period of time. Heavy users, they might have some metabolites from the cannabis plant for up to a month in their system. I think sometimes even heavier people have more fat to store it in and you might think you've kind of gotten it out of your system but a little heavy activity that day or something could release a lot into the system and somebody who wouldn't think they had cannabis in their system test positive. Or a lot of these other drugs, cocaine's out of your system within a day. Um, the opiates, depending on how short or long acting, can be out of the system within a day. So someone knowing they're going to go for a job interview, they can stop if they've got a drug problem with these other things. Uh, but as far as marijuana is concerned, you better not have used it for a long time. And there was a, a, a discussion uh, some, in, in talking with some other colleagues, um, and we were talking about you know, the fact that it stays in the system so long, and the federal government keeps saying that's why it's so dangerous. It stays in the system so long. And, and a couple of things we're trying to say, the metabolites are in the system. So one, it doesn't mean that a person is high from that dose for months down the road, it just means there's a metabolite in their system. But at the same time, you can think the body knows enough when, when we're taking cocaine or al alcohol, probably the, the best known, which isn't picked up on the urine screens, by the way, we aren't testing for alcohol, but alcohol is so toxic on the body that the liver literally, it, it kind of prioritizes and it says, I gotta get rid of this stuff. And it does, it, it detoxifies, I mean, it gets the, the alcohol out of our system and gets it out of there. You look at cannabis and it's kind of like, no big deal. This isn't a harmful thing coming into the system, so there's no hurry. And, and you know, that was someone else saying that to me and I thought, you know, that really does make sense. I mean, it just fits with all we understand. So what if it's in the body? It's the metabolites, they're not harmful. It's, it could be useful and just there when and if we need it. And that goes back again to the endocannabinoid system. It's not that we have these endogenous cannabinoids just floating on a, around our body all the time, but as they're needed, certain processes happen so that they're created to, to go fight. The level will go up as needed. It's kind of like, you know, fight or flight. When you need adrenaline real quick to do something, your body makes it and releases it. And I think the same thing, depending on what, where you are to keep that balance, the endocannabinoids will be made to be put in place to start some process to start it or slow it or whatever and, and, and our I mean the human body is amazing in terms of what it can do or not and I I think the more we're learning you know Western medicine today is is so disease oriented um, you know they, they, they focus on diseases and the, and the meds to try to fight it as opposed to health oriented how do you keep people healthy and, and as we're learning about the endocannabinoid system, we're learning other things. One of the ways to keep the endocannabinoid system healthy is um, acupuncture seems to help stimulate it. Uh, massage can help stimulate it. Uh, yoga, obviously good nutrition. These things you, know, you need to do to actually, there's a, kind of helps explain why they're helpful. Massage you know, increases um, circulation and you kind of get that, but it also just helps uh, boost the endocannabinoid system. So if you have a healthy en endocannabinoid system, you're better able to fight off these different stressors that come your way. You know, why is it that some people might be around others who are sick and they're not the sick one, you know? And others are getting sick all the time. Are they run down? Is that system just not working as well? And they don't, they can't fight off the problems as well. Let me talk about um, cannabis, the use for pain patients. And, and this one's really important because, again, this, you know, I, I said earlier that the um, cannabis prohibition is unjust. It's stupid. Uh, you know, and stupid doesn't cover it. It's just unjust and cruel. And by healthcare professionals buying into it, they end up practicing bad medicine. And pain patients 
are a clear example of um, practicing bad medicine. We all know uh, patients who have, have gone uh, to their doc, they get screen, they're, they're getting some kind of opiate to manage chronic, some chronic pain, severe pain, debilitating pain, um, and then marijuana pops up. The THC is positive on their drug screen. And unfortunately, a lot of docs will literally kick that patient out of the clinic. You're out of here, you broke your contract, I'm not dealing you with, with you. And of course, I mean, the docs are just too scared about the, the legal ramifications. They know the DEA is looking at them for all the prescriptions they're writing for opiates. Um, but by golly, if now I've got somebody who uses marijuana, you know, they just, they've been so indoctrinated, they think, oh, drug addict, he's probably selling these pills. You know, I mean, it just, they, they make these stories up, but they'll, you know, get rid of the patient. Two things. One, well, I'll talk about that one. The first one is you don't just dismiss a pain patient who's been on opiates for months. That's just bad medicine. Uh, yeah, you can't, you can't put them in withdrawal on purpose. If, if that was the issue, any doc, and some do it right. I mean, if they were going to do it and saying, I'm not going to take care of you anymore, still a bad decision. But if they say that, I'm going to taper you off and you're going to have to go find another physician. You know, that would be, but many of them will just stop. But the issue more important is it just shows that they don't understand how cannabis works with opiates. And research is, is out there now to, to help them understand that this is a good thing and the patients understand it's a good thing. What happens is uh, the THC and m most of the early studies were done with THC, but there are some with full cannabis too, but when mixed with opiates, there's a synergy and it's not a, it's not a bad synergy that gets to dangerousness, but they work differently, but they work to help with pain. And for most chronic pain patients, what you're going to find is they will either get off the opiate or they will significantly reduce the amount they use. Um, you know, just the legal patients, you can take Irv Rosenfeld, was getting dilated, and he was desperate. He had a lot of pain. He's the one with the, you know, the tumors on the end of his long bones. Severe pain, unable to walk, writhing, in, in, on falling out of bed, writhing in pain, you know, just not being able to move. He hurts so much. He would get desperate. He even would... Um, take the dilated IV sometimes, which he shouldn't do, but just needing something for pain real quickly. Got off it with the cannabis. George McMahon, he was using Percocet and other things for his pain control. And he'll, he speaks openly about getting, just stopping the Percocet and not even worrying about withdrawal. That was taken care of, but got rid of it completely. When a patient takes opiates, you got a couple of problems. If they need it regularly, all of us, anybody will become dependent on it. Will physically, the body will respond and need it to avoid withdrawal symptoms. They'll need a dose every so often to withdraw, uh, to avoid withdrawal symptoms. And that's just physiologically, it will happen to any one of us. Okay, so when you've got a pain patient and you're giving them that, they're now adjusted to it. The other thing that happens is over time, they need more and more. So the doses start going up and up and up. Opiates, with the use of opiates, one of the biggest concerns, uh, patient education-wise, is they're constipating. And, and I don't mean just a mild constipation. This can be dangerous. It can lead to impaction. It could lead to where you need surgery. So very often, chronic pain patients will take a stool, stool softener daily, or they'll manage somehow in their diet to get the right things to, to keep their bowels moving. They might need to resort to enemas, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, because that's serious business. A lot of them get nauseous from their uh, pills. Their pain medications um, can be very nauseating. A lot of patients get sick from them. Or being on a depressant, a pain medication, opiates are depressants, and they get depressed, and sometimes they're on antidepressants. So here comes this patient, and they, they try a little cannabis. Somebody recommends it, whatever, for whatever reason, they try the cannabis. They feel better. Most of them will say it doesn't take away the pain, but they say it's, it's not controlling me. I can put it in the back of the, my head. I'm, you know, I can just go on. It, it doesn't rule my life. And the opiates, they make me feel drugged. I can't do anything. I can't think straight. And they'll find that cannabis is helpful. I don't need that opiate. Or I'm, they either use remarkably less, or they can cut it off all completely. They don't need a stool softener anymore because cannabis is great to keep those bowels moving. They don't need anything for nausea. It's one of the better medications out there for, for nausea. And depression, it seems to help with that as well. So here you are in a pain clinic. You've got a patient coming to you. 
you've worked with them for years to try to get this, and you've given them the opiate, but in so doing, you need to now give them an antiemetic, you need to give them a stool softener, you need to give them an antidepressant to kind of help keep them in balance. And they're coming back with cannabis now saying, but I don't need that much of the opiate, and I don't need that stool softener anymore, and I don't need that. Now granted, this pharmaceutical companies don't like to hear that, we don't need your drugs, but from the patient's perspective, better function, clear-headed, able to converse with people, uh, feel better, quality of life is better, don't need all these other medications that they were only, half of them were medicating the symptoms, the side effects of the other medication. I mean, from any pain clinic, I would be, you know, you'd just be, good day, you know, success with this patient, you know, and, and the patient would be leaving happy. It's just, and, and I think, and, and it's, it's so evident, my background, starting out med surge nursing, but then I got into a substance abuse addictions nursing, 1985, I guess. I, start, I was teaching at UVA. I started teaching at the University of Virginia at the School of Nursing, and it was just basic nursing, taking, doing clinical skills with, with uh, students, and I ran a, a skills lab, but I started teaching a class on substance abuse. You know, and, and the more I learned, you know, you're just seeing all these patients in there with these problems, and, and healthcare professionals know nothing about it. I mean, they're so clueless, but um, when it comes to the pain, I, it's just, it's your answer, and you say, this is not a drug, they don't fit the, the, the uh, description of an addict, wanting more and more and less. Now you've got a cannabis patient who's saying, gee, I'm using this. No, I don't need a prescription, I don't need a refill yet. No, I've still got plenty left. I've only used a couple. You know, I had some bad days. That's not an addict talking. You will never get an addict telling you, I don't need my refill. And that's what happens. So it's, it's like, how can a healthcare professional, even if you don't have it, you know, a focus on, on substance abuse or addiction, how can you not get it? That's not, that's not a, an abuser. That's not an addict talking to say, I don't need it. You know, when someone's willing to give you this prescription, you go, no, no, I don't need it. I got lots left over.